Miami Dolphins mess is all on Brian Flores and Chris Greer. The Miami Dolphins are a mess on both sides of the ball but there are only two people to blame for what we are seeing on the field and they need to take responsibility. Two off-seasons ago the Miami Dolphins began an unprecedented rebuild. They gutted the roster, rid themselves of bad contracts and bad players. They set out to change the culture and to turn the Dolphins into a perennial playoff team. That was two seasons ago and it is clear that they have failed. We can point to Steven Ross and blame him. He hired Chris Greer and he hired Brian Flores but let's be clear, that wasn't the mistake that doomed this team. Greer and Flores failed to rebuild the roster and they failed to get the right players in place to win. We can debate who calls the personnel shots in Miami. Is it Flores who is making the draft decisions with Greer's blessings? Is Greer giving Flores more say than he should? Is Greer making all the decisions? We don't know and no one cares. This is what we do know. Greer traded away Pro Bowl left tackle Laramie Tunsil for a bevy of draft picks and practically wasted all of them. He signed Kyle Van Noy to a big contract and then released him a year later because he no longer valued Van Noy at that price. He traded for Bernardrick McKinney then reworked his contract and then cut him. He signed DJ Fluker, Jermaine Aluemunor, and Matt Skura. None of them made the final 53 and only Skura lasted to the final cuts. Two of them are producing as starters on other teams. That's bad enough but how about the money given to Jerome Baker? The restructured deal with more money for Xavier Howard? The huge contract that started the Howard issue that was given to Byron Jones? How about the massive deal for Jason Sanders? Of course, there is also Noah Igbenogany, Austin Jackson, and Solomon Kindley. The jury is still out on Javon Holland, Jalen Phillips, Robert Hunt, and even Tua Tungavailoa. We also can't dismiss the trades that Greer made during the draft this past season. Holding the third overall pick, Greer moved down to 13 and added more first-round picks and that's great but he gave up one of those firsts to move up to 6 to take Jalen Waddle. Waddle looks to be a good pick but consider this. Miami traded their own first-round pick to the Eagles in 2022. A pick that looks to be a top-5 pick. Is Waddle worth that? The Dolphins need to figure this all out. Flores is on a five-year deal and said a couple of weeks ago that the team is no longer in rebuild mode but if that is the case, they are just really bad and honestly, they look like a team that is still in rebuild mode. The bad part of it all? They very well may have to make big moves next year which will, in effect, be a rebuild. Again. Tua Tungavailoa plays well in return despite the loss. In another terrible loss on the season, the Miami Dolphins fell to the Jacksonville Jaguars in London on Sunday. This loss was just another terrible moment in a season where everything has gone completely the opposite way of preseason expectations, but Tua Tungavailoa returned. Miami has now lost five in a row and their playoff hopes look to be somewhat over. Of course, with the extended season there's still a chance, but they would need a bit of a miracle to pull that off and Miami doesn't look like they have that miracle in them on either side of the ball. If there is any positive in this one, Miami offense looked much better in this one than in weeks past. Tua Tungavailoa returned from a three-game absence nursing some broken ribs and played well enough to feel somewhat good about him going into next week. On the day, Tungavailoa finished 33-47 for 329 yards, two touchdowns and an interception. Honestly, despite the terrible loss, I believe this was one of Tungavailoa's better games as a pro. Yes, he wasn't perfect and his interception was a terrible ball that just didn't have enough drive on it, but that shouldn't overshadow a good day for the youngster. And yet, I felt he looked good when the pocket was clean and was able to get a few things going even when he had a few defenders in his face. This offensive line wasn't as bad as it has been over the last few weeks and when he had time, Tunga Vailoa looked like he could be the long-term solution at quarterback. He looked very accurate and poised in the pocket. He definitely needs to be better on his footwork so that he can get a little more power behind his throws, but he looked good after not playing in a game for three weeks. But, at the end of the day, Tungavailoa couldn't do enough to get this offense to put up touchdowns instead of field goals that could have changed the dynamics of the game. That wasn't all his fault, however, as penalties and sometimes bad play calling complicated a few of their short yardage situations. I would have liked him to overcome some of those challenges, but it's hard to fault him totally for any of the offensive issues. Tua Tungavailoa was not the problem in this game, but he will get some of the blame even though it should fall on the coaching staff. This team is not good right now even when individual players are putting up solid performances. 
This defense is not what it was last year which makes me wonder just how much of a fluke it was in 2020. The play calling is not consistently putting the offense in a position to succeed, please, pick one coordinator and tell him to stop running the waddle screen pass. There needs to be some accountability at the top for the performance of this team. Some of that might trickle down to Tunga Vailoa which, in my opinion, is not totally fair. He played well on Sunday and I can't blame him for this loss. But he won't win any more football games if the rest of his team can't be a bit more consistent all over the field.